now we're up to part four of six of my series on the history of the Iberian crypto Jews. Um, this week is actually <laughs> the first week is actually completely about the crypto Jews, actually, in not only in um, Iberia but also the colonies as well. So I'm really excited to start this part of this. Um, just recap, we'll recap the story so far. Now, next slide. Um, so on the first week, we actually, um, if we reviewed the um, sort of the possibility to the origins of the Sephardim. Um, our second week, we reviewed the golden age of the Sephardic Jewry in Spain. Last week, we reviewed the decline of Sephardic Jewry until the expulsion of 1492. Now, this week, um, we will review the story of Jews who stayed behind in, um, in Spain and Portugal, and also of those who made to Latin America. And just as a side note, um, I cannot do this topic justice at all in a single draft, so I, I, I will be sort of skipping in um, some details and going quite quickly, um, just to sort of give as much of an overview as possible, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, but today we'll do our best to review the various crypto Jewish movements in the Spanish and Portuguese world after the expulsion. Uh, so we'll continue. Um, this next slide is just a side note, which um, I've been sort of putting out the last few weeks just about the written accounts, which I will put out at some point, which will be much more detailed. So we'll move on from there, and I'll start um, with the numbers. So very, very difficult to estimate the numbers because in those days, we actually do have quite a lot of sources to go off, people who've studied this, but um, they kept good written records of what happened, but they didn't, um, there wasn't the systematic, um, sort of systematic, um, statistic, you know, the systematic, systematic way which we take stats today. And also we didn't um, do censuses as much back then. So, um, or censi, I'm not sure what the plural is exactly, but essentially um, the Inquisition records are really good in terms of description, but not so much in terms of quantitative aspects. So what I've quoted here is sort of like a rough guide to relevant numbers. So it does help us to characterize the tragedy of what happened. Um, so in terms of the number of people in Spain overall, it was believed to be around 7 million, with perhaps another 1 or 2 million in Portugal. Now, um, I've qu quoted here 100,000 Jews expelled in 1492. Now, that's a rough middle ground of the various estimates I have come across. I have come across 800,000, almost a million Jews, and I've also come across as low as 40,000. So, I've tried to you know, sort of give a rough middle ground here. Now, in terms of um, conversos in Spain, I put here just over 200,000. Um, now, the estimates are also quite variable here, but um, what's a key factor in all the um, estimates is that there were many more conversos, so Jews who had converted for various reasons to Christianity, to Catholicism, as uh, opposed to Jews who hadn't converted. And the Jews of Portugal were much smaller. There were 20,000 people, roughly. I'll get to them um, shortly. So the next question would be, where did they go? When the Jews left Spain, those 100,000 or so, where did they um, go in the end? So look, essentially, um, they, look, the majority went to Portugal, and what happened to them I'll, I'll quickly touch on um, in just a moment. The, um, other people went, other Jews went to different parts of the Mediterranean, mostly because they were, they were the easiest to get to. So North African countries such as Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, etc. Other parts of the Mediterranean, such as Greece, Italy, the Balkan countries, and also the Ottoman Empire, which includes modern-day Turkey and the um, sort of land of Israel, lands of the, the Assyrian lands, and also Iraq and parts of the wider Middle East. So really quite a few areas they went to. Um, some also went to France and, and um, the Netherlands as well. So um, quite a big diaspora of Sephardim um, took place. Initially, they were quite unwelcome in Morocco, um, but also made quite welcome elsewhere, particularly in the Ottoman Empire and in Holland. So actually, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at the time, Bayezid II, um, is quoted to have said, so he, call, he actually is speaking about the King of Spain, the, um, Ferdinand. So you ventured to call Ferdinand a wise ruler, so a rhetorical question. He who impoverishes his country and enriches mine. So he's referring to, um, obviously, Ferdinand ex ex expelling the Jews, and he calls them riches because he values the Jews' contributions to society. So he was very happy to accept them into his empire. So um, in terms of um, the definition of the Sephardi, the definition of the, of the Spaniard, um, it actually starts to evolve here in, in the Jewish context. So um, obviously, the Sephardi, as they went to all these different um, places, they intermingled and mixed with the local Jewish communities, and they influenced the culture and the traditions of the local Jewish population. 
Now, today, the Jewish communities in those areas are called Svaradim in acknowledgement of the great influence these Jews have had in settling these areas and have also sort of become the dominant Jewish culture. So it's um, the pure definition, so to speak, of the word Svaradi is Spaniard because that's what it means, but um, as these the Spanish diaspora took place uh, in terms of Sp Spanish Jews. They intermingled with other Jewish peoples and those communities also became known as the Sephardi communities after the, you know, they sort of took on, you know, a lot of the Sephardi traditions and the culture and they, um, you know, it, it evolved with the population. So that's an acknowledgement of that. So um, I just want to make a quick note. Um, the um, late rabbi, chief Sephardi rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Avadia Yosef, he's someone I, I do personally respect in some ways. Um, he was actually born in Iraq, and that's sort of why, you know, um, the, the population, the Sephardi culture made it as far as Iraq. So the Sephardi traditions, the language, and the approach to the Jewish law all made it that far. So, again, very interesting how the Sephardic diaspora really spread around the world. We'll continue on now to the next slide. I want to talk about in this slide the situation in Portugal. So Portugal is interesting, and it's going to have... Um, an interesting impact on the crypto Jewish um, movements around the world. So Portugal, up, up until 1492, had not experienced Inquisition at all and then had not generally experienced the persecutions that Spain did. So Portugal was was a more, um, it was a far more tolerable place to be a Jew in the 15th century. It was nowhere near as treacherous, nowhere near as um, precarious for the Portuguese community. Now, um, as a result, there were almost no conversos, almost no new Christians in 1492. So, um, the, the wide rate, rate um, the wide, um, the widespread conversions in Spain did not take place in Portugal until this point. There was only a very small Jewish community in Portugal, about 20,000. Um, from 1492 to 1497, um, as, as me mentioned previously, there were lots of refugees um, in Portugal from Spain, um, Spanish Jews who fled. There were wavering degrees of tolerance. Um, some of them, sometimes they were forced into slavery, sometimes they had to pay large sums of money for short-term visas. Um, but during the reign of um, Manuel I, um, he, um, you know, he was an interesting guy. He wanted the, to marry into the Spanish royal family to sort of, sort of um, elevate himself. And the, daughter, the Spanish monarchs had a daughter. Now, they would let him marry the daughter on one condition. And that one condition was expel the Jews or expel the, um, you know, the, the new converts or, I mean, sorry, expel the unconverted Jews from the kingdom. So essentially what he, he, he did was slightly different to what the Spanish um, monarchy did. He was quite fearful of the Jews leaving because he feared the economy would suffer. So he wanted, he didn't want the Jews to actually leave. So what he did was he forcibly converted the entire Jewish population virtually about 20,000 people. He literally, he essentially lured them into the capital and then he, um, there was some sort of mass baptismal ceremony where the Jews couldn't leave and then he, they forcibly baptized them, essentially. And um, this is where the term Anusim comes in. Um, Anusim literally means the fourth ones. La'anos in Hebrew means to force. Um, but also, um, it has a stronger connotation in Hebrew than in English. In, um, in Hebrew, the word La'anos, to force, can also be translated to rape as well. So, it was almost like a spiritual and religious raping of the people in the sense that they were really forced to accept a religion that was not their own. Now, um, also um, difference to what um, the Spanish um, monarchy did, um, Manuel I of Portugal gave the new Christians called Cristal Novos in Portuguese, I think. Um, he, he gave them about 40 years of grace. What I mean by that, he essentially did not officially persecute new Christians. He didn't um, officially interrogate them until about 1536 when the um, Portuguese Inquisition started. And that would have a massive um, impact on the crypto Jewish movement because it gave the Portuguese community a head start. They were also quite, um, you know, they were, quite, they were more zealous because they were the ones who fled in the first place to practice Judaism. And it would have a massive impact on Brazil in particular. So I'll get to that very shortly. Um, but before I do that, I'll talk about a bit about Spain. So, of course, there was an environment of fear in those days. After 1492, the only acceptable religion in Spain was Catholicism. And conversos were the main targets of the Inquisition for about the first 50 years. And then there was the other targets, such as Protestants, Lutherans, riches, etc. Now, 
After 1492, everyone fell under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. Um, most tried to assimilate. So, you know, most conversos, um, most new Christians were not particularly zealous for a particular religion. Most of them just wanted to be left alone in peace to live their lives with their families. So, you know, a very natural, um, you know, desire. Um, but most of them were not particularly zealous. Um, and people had um, sort of difficulty even trusting their own families. Um, you had a wife versus husband, brother versus sister, parent versus child. And what I mean by that is there will, there will often be families where, converso families, where some parts of the family wanted to actively keep their Judaism in some form, and others really aggressively wanted to assimilate. And both thinking, obviously, um, that their way was best. There was even a fear that their own family would denounce them to the Inquisition. So close friends, even acquaintances, colleagues, even families could not be trusted. It was a really terrible environment really to be, you know, the social fate framework was really strained. Now, there were two main categories of people who were willing to take the risk. Um, there were the so-called passive Judaizers. And what they were characterized by was sort of a mainly an omission of Christian practice. So they um, were, did not really take on too much Jewish stuff, but they sort of avoided Christian stuff as much as possible. By that, I mean um, avoiding going to mass, going to church, doing the bare minimum in terms of observances, um, professing Moses over Jesus, an interesting syncretic idea, and also disagreeing with um, key Christian doctrines or simply identifying as Jews internally without any other outward, outward sign of um, Judaizing. And um, there were some particularly interesting ideas, um, such as belief in the law of Moses um, as a way for salvation, which, of course, is a syncretic idea. Jews obviously believe to obey the law of Moses, but not to believe it as a source of salvation. So it's, there's a lot of syncretism which happened as a result. Um, there were also the active Judaizers, which were people who adopted Jewish practices. Um, all had to be easily concealed, of course. Um, most customs, um, uh, which were sort of overt, were very risky. So the people, who, uh, the, the customs which people adopted were mostly ones which could easily be hid, such as fasting. And um, I will talk a little bit about crypto Judaism in Spain. So what the religion of crypto Judaism actually involved. Now, it wasn't obviously a unified religion. It was a, a bunch of different people doing their best to hold on to what Judaism they had. But there were some customs which were observed widespread. So, um, for example, for Shabbat, there was a, a strong awareness of the, the Jewish Sabbath. Um, candles were lit on Friday nights in some families. There was a family meal. Um, there was also like um, other ways to honor the day, such as changing your clothes to clean clothes, um, changing bed sheets, changing tablecloths, washing. Um, so th those things were, um, were quite commonly done by Jews to honor the Sabbath. And was a way that could, there were ways of honoring the Sabbath which could be more discreet. Um, also dietary laws. So some people had very um, ingenious ways of trying to keep some semblance of kosher. So, for example, being a vegetarian was not very common in those days. So if you call yourself a vegetarian, today you would have no problem. But in those days, people would be very suspicious. So some people did that. Um, they were eating like, you know, in, in their own private homes, they would eat only kosher animals, um, but have to eat pork in front of the Christians. In Spanish and Portuguese society, pork is a big deal. So for them not to eat pork would have been very suspicious. So they sort of towed the line outside, but in the home they, um, you know, ate meat which was slaughtered in the right way and they drained the blood and they ate kosher animals. Fasting was very common. Fasting was relatively easy to keep because, um, you know, it was something that could be just done internally. Um, particular fasts which were kept were the fast of Esther for Purim and also Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Um, festivals were also remembered to some degree, um, but, but the practice varied. So um, there was a lot of syncretism which came um, into the observance of the festivals. So a combination of Jewish and Christian ideas and practices. I'll give some more examples soon. Um, the more overt customs, the more obvious customs, such as, you know, um, tefillin, the, the flatteries, the straps of leather around the arms, wearing tzitzit, the, the, the fringes, um, prayer books, Hebrew Bibles, building a tabernacle for the Feast of Tabernacles, having the four species to wave around, all those really obvious signs, um, wearing a kippur on your head, um, all of them were gone because they were too obvious. And unfortunately, by um, you know, in Spain, the Inquisition was probably remained the strongest. Um, the Jewish calendar also started to um, become lost. So the times of the festivals were changed. For example, um, Passover became the week before Easter, um, even though it's not specifically timed to Easter. And there was other difficulties as well. Unfortunately, in Spain, the movement quickly declined by the, the mid-1500s. Um, it persisted in Portugal quite a bit longer, even to the present day, but it also declined there 
in the mid 1700s as well. And why it declined? Look, of course, the persecution from the Inquisition, the Inquisition, but I think mainly two other reasons. The lack of knowledge, of course, no Hebrew books, no rabbis, no teaching, very difficult to maintain knowledge that way. And also difficulty organizing. Now, Judaism is a communal religion. It's not something that you can really do well as an individual. People have done it, but much more difficult. And it was very difficult to organize Jewish events, organize Jewish observances as a community. And that was a really, really big part of why the client. Now, in terms of um, um, crypto Judaism in Spain, that like the difficulties I've just mentioned, um, it also should be noted that crypto Jews had converted prior to the expulsion as well, up to 100 years beforehand. So there was also quite a, a bit of loss of knowledge before that too. But also, um, Obviously, the um, positive aspect was it didn't die out completely. And why didn't it die out completely? Well, firstly, there was the Tanakh. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, was available, and crypto Jews could read that still. Um, there's also um, the documents, ironically, given out by the Inquisition were very helpful. So the Edicts of Grace, which they detailed very specific Jewish practices to watch out for, they were actually very specific, so specific that crypto Jews actually could learn about Judaism from them. And they actually used those to actually learn about you know, to, to maintain their memories of Jewish practice. And of course, the, the tenacity and the perseverance of these Jews, and also I believe divine intervention. And I'm gonna donate a, a whole section to the divine aspects later on, but um, I just wanna mention it briefly here. Now, um, we'll now shift over to the colonies. In the colonies is where it gets really interesting. Um, in the colonies, by far the strongest presence, um, what I mean by, by colonies, so the colonies that Spain and Portugal, Portugal occupied in the Americas, by far the strongest presence was in New Spain, which is Mexico today, and also Brazil. There were also some in Peru and Colombia, and both countries had inquisitions there too. Elsewhere, there were very few until the 19th century. So the, the Sephardic diaspora did not really move into most other countries in, in you know, sort of Central and South America. Um, obviously, in the 19th and 20th centuries, there were lots of Jews moving to Argentina, for example, but very few of these um, sort of original Sephardim um, moved there initially. Now, um, we'll start with Brazil. Um, this is where it gets quite interesting. So um, as soon as the Portuguese claimed Brazil in the, 50, in, in the year 1500, um, crypto Jews were there. They were there from the very first ship. And Portugal actually, um, in sort of quite a bit of contrast to Spain, they actually encouraged new Christians to emigrate to the colonies. Spain tried to stop them um, emigrating, but the Portuguese encouraged new Christians to come to Brazil. There was never an inquisition in Brazil, which was a huge, um, as, you know, a hugely important aspect in sort of reducing the danger aspect, but um, the bishops of Brazil could send suspects to Portugal for trial. Ironically though, the punishment will often be sending them to back to Brazil, um, sending them back to Brazil. So the punishments were not as bad usually in Brazil um, overall. Um, of course, if they're from Brazil and they went back to Brazil after being tried, it wasn't such a big deal. Now, new Christians, as opposed to other parts of, um, of the colonies, were very powerful, very wealthy. They owned sugar plantations. Unfortunately, they also um, owned slaves in those days. All, all sort of white people in those days had slaves, if you were the colonizers, and um, they owned large bits of property. However, inquisitorial activity did increase um, from 1570 to 1630, though only a minority was for Judaizing. It was mostly for like other, other um, crimes. Now, um, the Dutch conquering Northeast Brazil in 1630, holding on for the next 24 years, changed Jewish history forever. So the Dutch were actually quite tolerant of the Jews and they allowed the Jews to, hold, to actually um, start Jewish practice. The first synagogue in the Americas was built in Recife, Recife, I think, in the year 1636. The first rabbi in the Americas was Rabbi Isaac Aboab de Fonseca in 1641. Now, people think the first synagogues and the first rabbis were actually in, in America, in New York, but actually was in Brazil um, because of this period of relative tolerance. At the peak of the, the tolerance, several thousand Jews lived in the territory of northeast Brazil, about half of the European population at the time. So it was really an amazing, an amazing experience for the Jews there. A lot of Jews came out of the closet, all of crypto Jews start openly practicing. And Jews from elsewhere actually emigrated to Brazil because it was so good. Unfortunately, it didn't last. Um, in 1654, the Dutch were expelled, but they secured three months for the Jews to make arrangements. So the Jews were able to sell their property, they're able to um, emigrate in an orderly fashion. Most Jews emigrated with the Dutch. Most of them went, um, um, back, uh, back to Holland or they went to other Dutch colonies 
including New Amsterdam in um, you know what, what would today be New York City. So a lot of the first Jews who established the biggest diaspora Jewish community in the world, New York City, actually came from this community here. Um, and those were left, who were left behind had to go underground again. Um, though the, and the community still had some crypto Jews, still had some hidden Jews, but it never really recovered. There was a lot of mass assimilation at the time. I think there was a huge morale loss for these Jews. And unfortunately, crypto Judaism was effectively suppressed um, by the time the inquisitorial activities ended in 1773. However, in Brazil today, B'nai Al-Nassim, so their descendants are coming forward today, which I'll talk about um, at great length um, in a couple of weeks. Now, in other colonies, so Mexico um, or New Spain, that was where crypto Judaism really thrived. Um, officially, they were excluded. New Christians were excluded from Mexico, but they still came. Uh, mainly for economic opportunity. There was lots of gold and silver land and, of course, slaves. The Mexican Inquisition was established in 1571, ended in 1820, a really long time, um, you know, almost 350 years. There were intense persecutions um, from about 1570 to about 1600, and again, the 1640s. However, in that intermediate period from 1600 to 1640, crypto Judaism experienced its most, arguably its most successful period in any community in Spain, Portugal, elsewhere. Um, and I'm talking about crypto Judaism. So in Brazil, you had open Judaism for a while, but um, um, in Mexico, it was still crypto Judaism, so it was still officially hidden. But due to a relative lull in the inquisitorial activity, those 40 years were the sort of, I would call the golden age um, of crypto Judaism in, in Mexico. I'll talk a bit about it. So um, crypto Jews were relatively open in their hair day period. So Mexico received many immigrants. So um, lots of new Christians, lots of conversos came to Mexico from other Latin countries. Um, and um, a lot of them actually came from places where Judaism was openly practiced, such as Holland. And therefore the community was refreshed with new people, with new knowledge. And these communities were tight and well-organized. They were well-organized, well-defined, resilient social networks, especially in cities. And that was really important. As I mentioned before, Judaism thrives when society, when, when social networks are able to proliferate. And that's really important for, for the success of this community. Um, the community was also relatively wealthy. It's at least middle class. Um, there are lots of merchants, um, artisans, so craftspeople, sometimes even the military. Um, the con some of the conquistadors were, the con sorry, the conquistadors, the people who conquered new land. Some of them were new Christians or crypto Jews. And there was a flourishing of crypto Judaism with some syncretism as well. Now, um, I'll give an example of some of the interesting syncretic, the syncretic practices um, that these Jews had. Again, a very small selection, but just interesting. So for the Passover, there was no bread um, the week before Easter. They had sort of lost the Jewish calendar, unfortunately. So they weren't able to, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically time it. But they used corn tortillas, apparently, if they couldn't get matzah. Also less suspicious um, to use that. Chocolate was the festive drink in Mexico. So instead of wine, they used chocolate. Um, communal meals were had at safe houses for the Shabbat and festivals. Some of the Catholic beliefs in purgatory, veneration of saints, and even icons start to appear even among crypto, crypto Jews. We can understand that even though they, they had a conscious objection to, to Catholicism, it was such a big part of their lives because they were nominal Catholics, they had to toe the line. It was no wonder that it started to creep into their beliefs. So there was some, there was some syncret, um, syncretism happening. And one of the most fascinating examples I actually read about was the festival of Santa Esterica. I'm not sure if anyone here has celebrated it before, but essentially, um, so Santa Esterica means Saint Esther, and local communities in Mexico often venerated their own saints, and crypto Jews had their own own saints, which was Queen Esther. They actually even had icons um, created to represent her in their homes. They were very attached to Queen Esther. She was a crypto Jew herself, as you know, from the story of Purim in ancient Persia. Um, she was made queen, but no one knew, or virtually no one knew she was Jewish until she told the king to stop the evil plans of the king's advisor, Haman. And of course, there was a happy ending. She, um, the king helped her and um, the Jews were saved. Um, now, perhaps these crypto Jews had the same hope for the same you know, restoration, the same deliverance that Esther um, brought on to her community. So um, it consisted of two parts. There was a three day fast, often taken in terms by the women in the house. Women were definitely um, the leaders of crypto Judaism in many ways because the home was the domain of the women in those days. Um, so the women of the household would take turns to fast 
And then there was a festive feast, which was also led by the women as well. It was usually a meal at home, some candles were lit, and um, also an opportunity to educate, especially the daughters, about the dietary laws. So a very interesting um, um, celebration, really. Because of course, because we know, of course, that you know Jews don't venerate saints. We don't um, um, paint icons for our um, for our for our heroes. But uh, interesting way of incorporating Purim into the, the context. By the end of the 18th century, unfortunately, most crypto Jewish movements around the world were heavily suppressed or extinguished. We don't hear much about them in the 19th century. Um, but um, next week um, we will discuss. The, the Judaism in these countries from the 18th century onwards, and also the modern reawakening of um, crypto, well, not crypto Judaism, but Judaism among people um, who are descended from these crypto Jews. So I want to um, end with a challenge, another challenge, because I, I, so many aspects of the story really inspired me personally in my walk with God, my walk with Jesus. And this one actually, you, you guys might think that's a bit ironic. How can you know people who despised Jesus, you know, challenged me in my walk. So I'll give you an example. So I want to talk about probably the most important family in Mexican in Mexican crypto Judaism um, called the Carvajals. I think it's how you pronounce it. Um, so I get my Spanish is not very good, so um, mm. forgive me for that. But I, I can, I can help you. It correct. Yeah. Is, it, is it right? You want to tell Carvajal? Luis de Carvajal. Yeah, as in like, so in, in this slide over here, how do I pronounce that name? Luis de Carvajal. Yeah, beautiful. I was right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah, you were. So, um, this gentleman, Luis de Carvajal, so he um, came to Mexico um, in 1567 from Iberia, and he became a, a renowned conquistador. He was actually a Catholic, a very he was a, he was a Catholic, a very devout Catholic, um, but descended from Jews um, about 100 years prior to that. He brought over his family to Mexico in 1580 because he was having a lot of success. Um, but some of his family were crypto Jews, actively Judaizing crypto Jews. And um, among those people um, included his nephew, who was called also Luis de Carvajal, but he was called the younger to distinguish from his uncle. Um, it's a really fascinating story because this family was probably the most influential family in Mexico um, for the crypto Jews. And they were the ones who really established the, the foundations for the Golden Age and also the preservation of the crypto Judaism. So he was first arrested for Judaizing in 1589. He was reconciled to the church by faking repentance. And then he was arrested again in 1596, but this time he was burnt, alive at the stake, with his mother and three sisters. So it was quite a tragedy for the community. Um, and um, as previously mentioned, the younger Louis de Carvajal, he was actually the leader of the, the crypto Jewish community. And his, his autobiography is actually still extant. You actually can read the autobiography today. I actually would recommend um, getting a copy of it. Like it's such an amazing story of hope and of perseverance. You can actually, I think, get it on Amazon. I got it, an English translation by subscribing to a library online, but um, definitely worthwhile if you have the inclination to, to learn more. Look, essentially, his, I will briefly summarize the main aspects. Look, his memo memoirs show his dedication to serving his community and his courage in sharing what he believed to everyone. He, also, he describes his travels around Mexico and he would encourage people, pray for people, and teach them about the Judaism. And he would just describe how various scriptures would give him strength and also convict him. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, there were a few particular aspects um, of what he did. So he actually circumcised himself. Now, it was extremely risky to circumcise yourself, of course, because all someone had to do was to check, pull down your pants, and see whether you were circumcised. And you were, no matter what sort of... Um, excuse you had, you were, you were a goner. It was, you know, you, you had no hope. So many people, even many people who actively Judaized did not get circumcised for that reason. So he talks about in his memoirs, reading Genesis 17 verse 14, where it says, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut from his people. He has broken my covenant. Talking about the Abrahamic covenant, of course. And he was so strongly like, attached to the Abrahamic covenant. He actually, he was a teenager at the time. He circumcised himself right away. He took some scissors and circumcised himself. And he took an incredible risk upon himself for doing that. And he actually um, um, shows us really a great example of obeying him even when it's dangerous. So um, I think a lot of people like, um, especially in the West, we don't really understand true danger when it comes to obeying God. But people like um, the Carbathal, um and others, you know, Christians around the world as well, the, for them, there is a great danger in obeying God. And um, this psalm comes to mind, Psalm 656, verse 3, 
when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. When we are afraid, when we're afraid of obeying God, we just have to trust him more and trust that he will deliver us. And even if we suffer various trials, as Paul did, which I will, I'll talk about in a moment, we, we can't lose our commitments to, to what we believe is right. And I, I respect Carvajal for that. Um, and next one, uh, another challenge from the Carvajals. Um, so, um, so the younger Carvajal, Louis the Carvajal, he traveled widely, he preached, um, his, you know, what he believed to be true, he educated wherever he went. So he um, would actually go around to different communities and, um, you know, not all of them were crypto Jewish communities. He actually went to a lot of like um, sort of normal Catholic communities and he actually preached what he believed wherever he went. And his perseverance, not only preaching, but also serving his community, I cannot overstate that. Like he was, um, you know, he really was, in, you know, imperative in keeping his communities alive and together and his he prayed for people he healed people he helped them as much as he could he was really a servant to the community over there and i think without meaning to he actually followed the example of the apostle paul and the apostle paul gives us a perfect example of this in acts chapter 14. when they had preached the gospel to that city, it's from verse 21 and had made many disciples they returned to lystra and to iconium and to antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that um, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they have appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Another really important aspect of what Paul did here with his disciples was he didn't only educate, he didn't only preach, he didn't only support and encourage, he also raised up new leaders for the church. And that's what Carvajal did as well. He actually tried to raise up new followers and new leaders in his community as well. Again, he, he personally did not have much respect for the Apostle Paul, I, I can imagine, but um, he, without meaning to, followed the example of Paul. And also, one of the most astounding things I've actually read so far, in, excuse me, the next slide, he actually spoke to a priest about this. He spoke to a Dominican friar, and he actually recorded a conversation he had with a Dominican friar about his beliefs. Of course, that's the extremely risky thing to do because the Dominicans, um, the people in the church, they had a, they had a you know, um, a hotline, so to speak, not really a phone hotline, but they, they had very quick access to inquisitors and he could very easily have denounced him to the inquisition right there and then. In fact, I think there was evidence that after doing this, that Carvajal did get um, denounced after this. I think this was the turning point. But again, he took the risk. He, 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 was, um, he believed in his message so much that he would t speak to a priest about this. And to me, that really reminds us of Paul's attitude again. And he faced certain danger in the preaching of the gospel. Again, from Acts 21, verse 13. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So in this context here, Paul was going to Jerusalem to preach the gospel. And a lot of his, um, you know, his colleagues were saying to him, you know, it's dangerous there. You, you, you're going to be stoned and killed because they hate you. But Paul was saying, you know, I, I, you know not he, he recognizes the danger, but he's going to go anyway. And that's, um, you know, something that Carvajal um, definitely did for his beliefs and it challenges me as well because this man was only a nominal Catholic, a nominal Christian. He did not believe in Jesus at all, but he was able to exhibit so many of the behaviors we, we believe as a call to embody. And it's interesting how, um, look, in the early church, the Christians were the ones persecuted and they were the ones exhibiting these amazing behaviors of courage, of perseverance, of endurance and great faith. Unfortunately, the Christians and the Catholics actually became the persecutors um, in this episode. And um, some of these crypto Jews actually exhibited such great um, feats of um, service and of, of spirit-filled behavior. And for me, it was, it's a massive challenge. Like as professing believers, we need to be able to step up to the place. Like if, if someone who is not even a believer of Jesus and, um, you know, not only doesn't believe in him, but also like, despises Christianity, is able to live such a life of service to his community, em embodying so many of these beliefs, we as believers are even more so called up to step up in our lives. And we enjoy much better circumstances than, than they did. Like he was um, eventually burnt alive for his, his work. So um, many Christians around the world also are um, killed for their faith and killed for their service and their obedience. But in the West, we are not, um, you know, so far, you know, who knows in the future what's going to be like, but at the moment we're not. And I think people like this, People who were victims of the church were able to do this. We can do it ourselves. I think that's, that's, that was a big challenge for me, which I, I really took to heart from, from the story. I definitely recommend reading that. So I'll stop um, here now. Um, that's enough for this week.